This is Detroit, a previously wealthy city that has now become the poster child for the places that economic prosperity has left behind. The story of Detroit's decline from an economic powerhouse to a city where roughly 35% of its residents live below the poverty line is so well documented that we'll receive very little value from rehashing it here. To oversimplify a ridiculously complex story, Detroit used to have one of the strongest auto manufacturing industries in the world. Competition from foreign manufacturing plants suddenly made Detroit an unattractive destination for building cars. As jobs in the car manufacturing industry became scarce, Detroit was unable to pivot to higher value industries that could sustain its economy. And when the jobs left, the people that could leave Detroit did. Detroit's population today is about one third of its population at its peak. But Detroit isn't the only city that has had a hard time attracting new residents. In fact, scientists estimate that 25% of cities across the world saw their populations decline between 2013 and 2018. They also predict that the number of shrinking cities will grow to roughly 37% of all cities between 2018 and 2050. The people with the means to leave will always leave. However, the people who are forced to stay will find themselves in a city that offers poor public services, few job opportunities, and the social problems that come with them. To avoid becoming the next Detroit, cities across the globe are rushing to implement policies to attract new residents. These policies range from the boring, think tax breaks or fancy amenities, to the more creative. For instance, many rural areas in Japan are offering free homes to attract new residents. But maybe the push for new residents is misplaced. The fact is that not every city can be a growing city. The United Nations estimates that the global population will stabilise by 2100. If you live in New York, Toronto or San Francisco, then you might think that your city could never become a shrinking city. And you might be right. But of course, mid 20th century Detroiters believed that as well. So what is the history of shrinking cities? Why do shrinking cities have a bad reputation? And finally, can shrinking cities become economic miracles? This episode of Economics Explained is brought to you by Blinkist. Blinkist is a tool designed to deliver concise knowledge perfect for the time conscious learner. The app distills over 5,500 non-fiction books and podcasts into 15-minute blinks, catering to diverse interests across 27 categories. For me, it's been a game changer. Blinkist gives me the gist of full-length books in a way that fits perfectly into my busy schedule of creating content for this YouTube channel. Blinkist also offers audio summaries, a convenient option for learning on the go, say during a commute or on a run. With their new space feature, I've been able to create a virtual book club with my friends. We share, recommend, and access titles together, learning from each other along the way. What sets Blinkist apart is quality content and its ability to merge education with entertainment seamlessly. Just recently, I delved into Yuval Harari's 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. It illuminated the fact that despite technological progress, human emotional intelligence remains paramount. I highly suggest this Blink to you. Get 25% off Blinkist Premium and start your 7-day free trial by clicking the link in the description. Whether we like it or not, shrinking cities will become a growing part of our urban environment. Instead of fighting the trend, our time may be better spent preparing for it. Urban depopulation has been around since cities have been around. In times of empire, shrinking cities were the result of some calamity, war, natural disaster, famine, just to give some examples. The Third Punic War destroyed Carthage, the city of Rome collapsed along with the Roman Empire, plague hit Paris in 1466, the Great Fire burned down London in 1666, and the list continues. Sometimes a city's shrinkage is temporary, as was the case for London and Paris, whereas other times they are more permanent. When the Industrial Revolution began, large metropolises lured residents away from small towns and rural areas to become the high-density behemoths we know them as today. But large metropolises weren't always popular amongst researchers and policymakers. Prior to the 20th century, in fact, they faced a lot of criticism. At the height of industrialization, cities were growing so quickly that urban planning had to play catch-up. Chicago was a great example of this. In 1840, only about 4,000 people resided in Chicago. 50 years later, that number rose to more than 1 million. While this population boom benefited Chicago's economy, it also led to severe housing shortages, the deterioration of infrastructure and acute hygiene problems. Under this backdrop of growing cities, in 1898, Sir Ebenezer Howard proposed the Garden City. These were to be small towns of about 30,000 people that circled only slightly larger main cities. Howard thought that this garden city could have the best of urban and rural areas without the defects of either. The ideas that Howard and others like him proposed were specifically designed to be the opposite of the cities that were common at the time. They emphasised low density, close-knit communities and environmental protection. But urban planning faced a paradigm shift in the late 20th century. 
By then, the former global industrial centres became the global deindustrialization centres. In the 1980s and 1990s, these cities, like Detroit in the United States and Manchester in the United Kingdom, lost many of their residents to London and New York. We saw a similar paradigm shift in the post-Soviet Union. Cities from Russia to East Germany to Ukraine all faced acute competition from cities in the West. And because this was the first time that many of these cities had faced any competition at all, they inevitably lost in the fight for residents. When shrinkage becomes associated with economic ruin, urban planners refocus their efforts from promoting city shrinkage to promoting city growth. But why do shrinking cities have a bad reputation? Most cities gain revenue through two channels, property taxes and funding from higher levels of government. In some countries, municipalities can sell bonds or levy income taxes, but this isn't common practice everywhere. When a population shrinks, the property taxes that the city government receives shrink also, for two reasons. First and most obvious, fewer people means fewer homes to tax. Second and less obvious, fewer people reduces the demand for housing, which lowers the property value for existing homes, and because the property tax is a percentage of a house's value, the total amount paid by current homeowners falls too. As the total taxes that Detroit receives from properties has fallen, it has been forced to increase its tax rate to make up the shortfall. Today, Detroit has one of the highest effective property tax rates in the United States, which adds another layer of difficulty to persuade people to move to Detroit. Government funding is the second source of revenue for cities, and because government funding is usually tied with a city's population size, shrinking cities tend to see their government funds dwindle as their residents leave. In 2022, Detroit launched a legal challenge against the US Census Bureau for under-reporting Detroit's population. According to Detroit's lawsuit, the bureau undercounting threatens millions of dollars of funding which Detroiters are entitled. So city shrinkage creates revenue shrinkage. But a small revenue isn't by itself a problem. Many small towns do well, even without a New York-sized budget. The problem occurs when cities with a dwindling tax revenue are expected to service the same area as when their tax revenue was much higher. Since 1926, Detroit has been responsible for 139 square miles, despite its dwindling population. Compare that with, say, San Francisco, which has a population of 815,000 residents, but an area of only 46 square miles. However, San Francisco projects that the total funds it will receive in the 2022-2023 fiscal year will be close to $14 billion, whereas Detroit projects that those funds will sum to around $2.5 billion. This translates to $14 million per square mile in revenue for Detroit, but $280 million per square mile in revenue for San Francisco. It is much easier for San Francisco to service its 46 square miles than it is for Detroit to service their 139 square miles. The Detroit must service the same land area despite its shrinking tax revenue makes maintaining infrastructure and city services especially challenging. This often leads to damaged infrastructure, abandoned buildings and poor public services. Damaged infrastructure makes it difficult to attract new companies, abandoned buildings often attract more crime, and poor public services incentivize current residents to move to cities where their services are better. The second issue with city shrinkage is employment shrinkage. When populations decline, fewer residents are able to perform the duties that local companies demand. This forces companies to relocate, possibly to the city where their former workforce is gone. The residents remaining in a shrinking city are also usually older and less educated than the ones with the means to leave. This makes attracting companies challenging because the city lacks the human capital that companies need to grow. These types of shrinkages in revenue and in job opportunities makes a difficult situation even worse. Those who remain in a shrinking city tend to be low-income households who are more reliant on city resources than those who left. Because a lot of tax revenue must be spent on caring for low-income households, there is little left over to reinvest into the city, so while public infrastructure and investments to attract new residents are neglected, urban decline worsens, which means more money must be funneled into social services, and so the spiral continues. As a result, the shrinking city falls into a shrinking trap that is difficult to escape despite their best efforts. But can shrinking cities become economic miracles? With all the potential harm that comes from shrinkage, it's no wonder that many cities are trying to buck the trend. In 2011, three of Detroit's largest employers in Midtown, just north of downtown Detroit, implemented an incentive program called Live Midtown to attract new residents and retain the residents already there. The incentives included rental assistance, forgivable loans for a down payment on a house, and a home renovation allowance. The program succeeded. From 2011 to 2015, Live Midtown is credited with attracting 1,000 residents to the area. This is in spite of the fact that Detroit has still lost residents during that time. It also seems that a diverse population took advantage of the subsidies that Live Midtown offered. Gentrification has always been a concern amongst Detroit residents as companies and policymakers attempt to revitalise the city. 
Policies will have to be well thought out to ensure that they benefit as many groups as possible. But there's also a question of if incentives will work for every shrinking city. Take rural areas in Japan, for instance. Japan has one of the lowest fertility rates in the world. Japan also has some of the lowest levels of immigration amongst developed countries. Providing cheap homes is a good way to attract residents from other parts of Japan, but this doesn't do shrinking cities in Japan much good when the country's entire population is shrinking. Cities competing with each other for a limited number of total residents does not solve the underlying issues of low fertility rates coupled with low immigration. Of course, cities have no say in a country's immigration policies. Yes, incentives like loan forgiveness programs and free homes can be helpful, but they may have unintended consequences. We also shouldn't expect them to work in the long run for shrinking cities where shrinkage is due to factors outside of that city's control. But maybe we don't need to reverse the trend of shrinking cities in the first place. The reality is, shrinking cities are here to stay. Rather than accepting that city shrinkage is linked to economic decline, we can instead consider ways for a city to prosper even with a declining population. When we think of population decline, we tend to think of economic ruin, but the two don't always go hand in hand. In fact, New Orleans is a great example of the two diverging. According to a 2019 paper, 27% of the 886 shrinking cities in the United States between 1980 and 2010 had median incomes higher than their regional average. Also, 97% of these prosperous shrinking cities had a higher proportion of residents with at least a bachelor's degree than their regional average. This same study also finds no significant relationship between income and the severity of city shrinkage. These statistics might be head-scratching at first, but they actually make a lot of sense. Some residents may be attracted to shrinking cities for the same reason that others are repelled by them. For instance, shrinking cities have much less road congestion than dense cities. And yes, shrinking cities can create many vacant homes, but this makes the remaining homes more affordable for new residents. Now, all of this isn't to put lipstick on a pig. The issues with shrinking cities that we mentioned before, shrinking tax revenues and a shrinking supply of jobs, still stand. But the point here is to push urban planners to leverage the advantages that shrinking cities have over growing cities. When we look at city shrinkage through that lens, then we can start to think about smart shrinkage. In a nutshell, smart shrinkage is the idea that policymakers should build for less. Instead of building more homes in the hopes of attracting people, convert empty residential areas into green spaces accessible to everyone. Instead of constructing more roads, build parks. By reducing the infrastructure that shrinking cities have to manage, they can instead channel more of their funds into maintaining the infrastructure that they had previously neglected. Of course, not every shrinking city can be successful, just like not every growing city can be successful. Although a quarter of shrinking cities in the United States are performing better than their peers, that still leaves three quarters of shrinking cities trailing behind. However, we can look at what those success stories are doing well and then set up other cities to replicate their achievements. One observation that the researchers made was that most of these prosperous shrinking cities, 86%, were nearby large metropolitan areas. This emphasises the importance of having an anchor city that supports these smaller regions. Not every shrinking city can neighbour a large metropolis, but with support from higher levels of government, shrinking cities can establish stronger economic ties with their closest economic juggernauts. In some ways, urban planning may take a page out of the garden city we mentioned earlier, where smaller communities circle larger cities. When thinking about shrinking cities, we should remember that Detroit used to have close to 2 million people. By all estimates, it was on track to be one of the most significant cities in the United States, maybe even the world. Today's bustling metropolises could be tomorrow's cautionary tales. If that sounds bleak, you may appreciate the perspective of smart shrinkage. Population decline doesn't have to parallel economic decline. Smart shrinkage recognises that the world's population can't grow forever. Either shrinkage or low population growth will become the norm for most cities. Smart shrinkage repurposes existing urban spaces to promote environmental and social goals such as reducing pollution or lowering crime rates. This contrasts with the growth mindset of build, build, build. In this way, we've come full circle, haven't we? At one point, researchers and urban planners advocated for small, low-density towns over large, high-density cities. Then deindustrialization and competition forced cities to take on a growth mindset. In the future, small, low-density cities may become the ideal again.